Hello and welcome to Game Shack. Once again, it's time to check out some games that were never released outside of Japan. This is the 15th such episode, in fact. And just like in Left in Japan 14, I'm going to focus on games that were based on Western IPs that were oddly Japan exclusive. I've got a bunch of these, over 20 in fact, so let's check out some games that they kept to themselves. Or maybe ones that we didn't want. Remember Airwolf on the NES from Acclaim? This is, of course, based on the Airwolf TV show. This game had a lot of potential with first-person shooting segments and side-view landing segments. Its main issue is that the controls are horrible. So many 8-bit games had control as an afterthought and, if I'm being honest, game design as well. It's just how it was back then. But did you know that there was a completely different Airwolf game released only in Japan on the Famicom? This one is from Kyugo and is a horizontal shooter. Unfortunately, it's not a great game either. The issues here aren't really with the controller or the design, it's just bad programming. The game just chugs along and it's rarely a pleasant experience for your eyeballs. The developers put so much on screen that you can get lost in the flicker, and oftentimes enemy projectiles are very difficult to see. Not only that, but the stages are very long. You can choose your weapons before a stage, and this can help out quite a bit. Just like the US game, an 8-bit rendition of the Airwolf theme plays again and again, which is honestly the game's biggest strength. Hugo would also go on to make Crossfire on the Genesis, which is known as Super Airwolf in Japan. It also is not a great game. Choosing between the two NES Airwolves? Well, I think the US game is better. Hugo just wasn't meant to be one of the greats. Here's the amazing Spider-Man, Lethal Foes for the Super Famicom from Epoch. Epoch is mostly known for their Doraemon games. You play as Spider-Man and you mainly take down fearsome enemies like bees, scorpions, and of course aliens. You can punch, jump, and shoot web projectiles, but not swing from your web. Gotta be honest, this game is pretty janky. Jumping is very odd and it's difficult to become accustomed to. The second stage is a large maze with a very low time limit and I just didn't care enough about this one to try it more than twice. The graphics are basic for the console and the music is fairly bad. Japan can go ahead and keep this turd. Another game from Epoch for the Super Famicom is Donald Duck no Maho no Boshi or Donald Duck and the Magical Hat or Cap. This is an immensely better game than their Spider-Man effort. You're walking along with Daisy Duck and she wants a new hat, and that means you need to earn the funds to provide it for her because, well, that's what you do. You take on a few odd jobs of your choice, like delivering papers to a bunch of different mailboxes or washing a lot of windows on a big building while the tenants toss things at you. Because, you know, of course they do. Once you raise enough funds, you return to find that Daisy is missing. Then you embark on a side-scrolling platforming adventure. You can tackle these stages in the order that you prefer. The stages are all quite unique, and that's what really brings this game its charm. I wish the control could be more customized, as the action button is always A no matter what. But you will get used to it. The jumping and whatnot all work fairly well. The graphics are excellent for the console, with a lot of color and detail everywhere. This one is definitely in the top 15% or so of good-looking games for the system, for sure. Even the sound and music are great, with fitting tunes and excellent sound quality. The game is quite easy, though, as it seems to be aimed at younger players. That's okay, I still recommend that everyone give it a go if you can. It's too bad that this one was never brought out in the West, as it really stands out with every stage being so unique.
Were you alive back in 1989? Well, I was. And you want to know what the hottest thing was back in 1989? I mean, besides the 16-bit Sega Genesis video entertainment system, it was Batman. And boy, did we get a lot of great 1989 Batman video games. Well, actually, we didn't get all of them. Here's Batman on the PC Engine from Sunsoft, based on the 1989 movie. It's been a while since I've talked about this one. We did half an episode on games based on 1989 Batman back in September of 2011. Episode number 22, in fact. Each major platform of the time got their very own version of Batman, and the PC Engine version here was the only one to stay in Japan. As Gotham's Dark Knight, it's your job to defeat the criminals. Wait, no, that's definitely not what's going on in this game. Let me try that again. As Gotham's janitor, it's your job to pick up the trash or clean the vandalized paintings in the museum, just like in the movie. Though later on, you've had enough and you're planting bombs in the Axis chemical factory. Enemies are running around and if they touch you, you die. Doesn't take much to bring down the Batman. You can toss batarangs to stun the enemies who then die if you touch them before they recover. But a new enemy will eventually respawn in their place. The main problem is, is that you're completely immobilized and defenseless as you toss the batarangs. You can collect power-ups which will let you walk faster, toss more batarangs, and also toss them faster and things like that. Once you pick up all of the trash, clean all the paintings, or plant all the bombs, you win the stage. And there are a ton of these stages in each area. The best thing about this game is the music. I don't think this would have helped a TurboGrafx-16 at all if it came out stateside. If anything, it would have made the console look a lot weaker than the Genesis and even the NES, both of which had much more technically impressive and fun Batman games. I may have to revisit this one in the future if I do another Games That Make the Console Look Weak episode. King Kong 2, Akari no Megaton Punch on the Famicom from Konami was released in 1986 and had never made it outside of Japan, hence the inclusion in this episode. Being from Konami, you know that this game will be a bit better than most. This is loosely based on the movie King Kong Lives, which was called King Kong 2 in Japan and was released the same year as this game. You play as King Kong himself, and you're off to rescue your lady friend, who I assume is Queen Kong. I don't know, I haven't seen the movie. And now I don't have to because I've played the game. Seriously, how different can they be? You can punch things to oblivion and you can jump. If you press the select button, you can toggle between punches and throwing rocks if you have any in your inventory. This would be a great game for a three button controller as toggling between the two attacks is a bit cumbersome. You make your way screen to screen. Sometimes you'll encounter glowing door things and touching these will take you to a different place. This game is very maze-like, so you'll have fun mapping everything out. Or maybe you won't, it really depends on what you like. You need to find the bosses and get a key from them, just like in the movie, I assume. I like smashing the buildings and doing things that King Kong would definitely do. Just like the movie, you only have three lives and no continue, so be sure to keep your life meter as high as you can. The soundtrack and the acting are very likely better than the movie. It's too bad that this one wasn't released outside of Japan because it's certainly not bad at all. Konami also made King Kong 2, Yomigaru Densetsu on the MSX. That's right, the good old MSX. This is a completely different game from the one on the Famicom. Here, you play as the character named Mitchell from the movie and you're on a mission to capture Queen Kong. Like the Famicom version, this one is played screen to screen. I can't really figure out what to do, though I'm sure these shops and huts would give me an idea if I could read the language. And please stop telling me to use Google Translate on Japanese games. It absolutely does not work well at all for these old games that run in such a low resolution as you can see. Google Translate just needs more resolution to work with than this. However, I was able to find an English translation and yeah, it definitely helps. 
You need certain weapons to kill certain creatures, like this knife for the big spider. Then you need to farm the money to buy the next weapon to kill the next creature, which can take a while. Then when you go to buy it, they won't sell it to you because you need to reach a certain level, and of course they don't tell you which level that might be. Here, I'm told to use a rock to crush this grass ogre. There is a rock that you can push around, but you can't push it down past this screen for some unexplained reason. There's nothing blocking it. It's fairly easy to lose your life and die, but you seem to be able to continue from the point where you died without penalty. It's gonna take you a long while to earn enough money and experience to get through this one. The Famicom game is much better, as was almost always the case. You guys demanded more Japanese Popeye games because everyone without exception loves themselves some Popeye. Yeah, Popeye! So here's Popeye on the Game Boy from Sigma. This is a maze game where you need to collect heart icons, olive oil, and then collect Sweet Pea to win the stage. Meanwhile, Bluto or Brutus is roaming around. If he touches you, you'll get into a fight and good luck winning. If you've already collected olive oil, she'll run away as you fight, so you'll need to kidnap her again. Be careful because Blutus, yeah I'm just gonna call him Blutus now, can even catch you across walls and instigate a fight. There are hamburgers laying around blocking you, and if you're lucky, Wimpy will eat one of them and free your path. Popeye can collect some spinach to move faster for a while, and it also allows him to destroy hamburgers and lesser enemies. The timer is pretty short, and if you get in a fight with Blutus, it's all but guaranteed that you're gonna run out of time and lose the stage. This one is good for a casual play here and there. It's far from amazing, but I'm still surprised that it didn't get released outside of Japan because the Game Boy was full of stuff like this. If they didn't want to pay for the license, they could have just reskinned it with generic characters. But apparently no Western publishers cared enough. Popeye 2 did get released outside of Japan though. This one is a proper platformer and by far the better game. Next, there's Popeye Beach Volleyball on the Game Gear from Technos. You and various Popeye characters play volleyball. The control feels laggy and imprecise, as it's often difficult to get your characters to where they need to be to hit the damn ball! I can only imagine how much worse this would be on the blurry and dim Game Gear screen. Yikes, that certainly doesn't help much at all now, does it? Still, if you're playing it on the analog pocket like I am, the graphics are bright and crisp with a few different places to play volleyball. I feel that it would work better if the screen didn't scroll so I could always tell where my character was. That would make it a lot easier to respond to quick spikes coming my way. Some of this, of course, has to do with the Game Gear's low resolution, as it kind of forces things to be zoomed in. Technos got dodgeball video games mostly, right? But volleyball, not so much. The last Popeye game is Popeye, Ijiwaro Majo Sihag no Maki for the Super Famicom. This is a board game, in Japanese, <laughs> no thanks. It's too bad because the title screen makes it look like a fun platformer. But no, you get boredom instead, I mean a board game instead. But wait, there's an English fan translation out there which turns this into Popeye, Tale of the Teasing Witch Seahag. This allowed me to get into it a little easier, and there are plenty of platforming stages in here. It really depends on the spot you land on on the board. I think that you're trying to get all of Wimpy's hearts after he was turned to stone. You can see them on the board, and if you land on one, you're taken to a stage where you can grab it. But if you die before getting it, the heart will move to a different place on the board. Speaking of dying, this can be easy to do, mainly because you'll fall off bottomless pits that you didn't even know were there. Unfortunately, the game only runs at 30 frames per second, and that can make platforming less precise than most people would prefer. Still, I like all the things you can do with Popeye. He can attack in eight directions with his anchor. 
He can also get power-up items that he can use, like turning into a frog to fit into tight spots. Out on the board, things are moving around, and if you run into one of these things, you'll have to fight them. This will happen a lot. And by a lot, I mean a lot! This game has a lot of potential, but honestly, it's kind of ruined by the board game nonsense. I don't like relying on random chance. Maybe if I enjoyed gambling, but I don't. This is worse than the dice maze in Gunstar Heroes, much worse in fact. I just want to get on with the game and maybe see something else, but no. I decided to nope out after playing for well over an hour, collecting six hearts, and the game still didn't want to advance. The graphics are nice other than the slow frame rate, and they have some great color. I think that the English hack introduces a few graphical bugs, as sometimes the backgrounds will turn mosaic for a bit, and I can't imagine the unmodified game doing this. Like I said, this one has a lot of potential, but I feel that only board game enthusiasts will dig it. A very wise man once said, if this were better, it would suck less than it does. You ever read the comics? I don't mean comic books, I mean comics and newspapers. You remember newspapers? Well, this next game is based on a comic that I read occasionally, but I never really thought was funny. I don't know, maybe if I was born in the 50s. I know, I know, I wasn't born in the 50s, but yeah, let's just get to the game. This is Snoopy Concert for the Super Famicom from Nintendo. This one is a point and click adventure and you can use the mouse or a normal controller. It's based on the comic strip Peanuts, and each character has their own seemingly unrelated scenario for you to play through. You usually play as Snoopy, or more specifically, his bird friend Woodstock. You move Woodstock around and click to call Snoopy's attention to something. Move him up high to make Snoopy jump. It sort of reminds me of Pac-Man 2. Have you played Pac-Man 2? Often you're performing an errand like bringing Charlie Brown's sister's lunch to school for her. I forget her name, I'm not really much of a Peanuts fan. She then tells you to do something, and you need to go do it. This is one of those games where the bottom half of the screen is twice the horizontal resolution than the top half to benefit the text. If you watched the last episode about pushing hardware limits, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. As a result, Google Translate tends to be a little bit more reliable in this game. The graphics are quite nice, and the music sounds excellent as well. I'm not sure how much of a following Peanuts has in Japan, but this would have been a good game to have here. In fact, it's kind of bizarre that Nintendo didn't bring it over to help promote their mouse. I wonder if Charles Schultz played this one before he died. I'm sure he was fluent in Japanese. This is Super Rambo Special on the MSX2 from Pac-In Video. You take control of Rambo and attack or avoid enemies. I find it's easier to avoid them if I can. You collect weapons and keys and whatnot. It plays kind of like Metal Gear before Metal Gear existed. It's extremely tough at first, but slowly you'll figure out what you need to do. Grabbing these blue flowers fills your life bar and it also adds a flower to your inventory. Using the flower will restore some of your life if it gets low, and it will. The yellow flowers will drain your life, probably because you're getting stung by bees or something, so be sure to avoid them. It's important to know that this game is extremely primitive and you shouldn't expect smooth 16-bit controls or anything like that. You can only move and shoot in four directions, but the same goes for your enemies. You can get a lot of different weapons, but of course they each have an extremely limited number of shots. The graphics have a high horizontal resolution, but otherwise there's no scrolling or anything special at all. I mean, come on, it's the MSX. This is not an easy game, but one thing that is easy about it is the decision to try again to see if maybe you can make it a few screens further.
Super Back to the Future 2 came to the Super Famicom from Toshiba EMI. There's a reason this one stayed in Japan. There seem to be a lot of people who think this game is good, but it's not. It's absolutely not. You play as Marty riding around on a hoverboard. You have a button to speed yourself up and the other button doubles as your jump and attack. You collect coins and if you smash certain vending machines you can restore some of your life as you can only take three hits. Sometimes you even get to fight a boss. This game has so much potential, but it feels very unfinished. For one, there are barely any bad guys around. Also, anytime something is on the screen beside yourself, and I mean practically anything, even coins, the game slows down to a crawl which makes it dreadful to play. Next, the levels are incredibly long and of course there are no checkpoints. Why would there be? You've got all the time in the world. The only things that this game has going for it are some bright colors and the fact that it's better than the other Back to the Future games on other consoles, and that's really a low bar. A lot of the music is pretty good though. If you enjoy this one, don't forget to be butthurt about my review in the comments. I'll probably forget I said that by the time this episode comes out and I'm going to be super confused as why so many angry comments about Super Back to the Future 2. Oh well. This is Knight Rider Special on the PC Engine from Pack-In Video. Pack it in, boys. This, of course, is based on the TV show Knight Rider starring David Hasselhoff. There he is! At first, it appears to be a racing game where you drive Kit. My first mistake was assuming as much. Once you get to 200 kilometers per hour, you do a jump and, of course, crash after you hit an obstacle. But the game actually wants you to control it like road blasters. So, you press up to accelerate, but you don't have to hold up. You can go well beyond 200 kph this way, and if you press the one button, you'll jump if you're going faster than 200. The two button shoots down your enemies, which is basically anyone else on the road. I can relate. You have a fairly strict timer to worry about as well. After each stage will be a boss fight, which sort of reminds me of Chase HQ. You need to jump over their attacks and either ram them or shoot them until they die forever. Between stages, the lady, I'm sorry I forget her name, it's been a while since I've seen the show, but she'll offer you an upgrade for your car. Like this one called One Side. It lets you go up on two wheels to steer more easily and take turns faster, but your overall speed decreases and you can't shoot while it's engaged. You can change items as you drive by hitting the select button. The graphics are pretty basic on the console and nothing to write home about, but I felt the music was pretty decent. Overall, it's certainly not a horrible game, but NEC was so cheap that they probably would have lost the license if they decided to bring it out in the US. Remember the movie Major League with Charlie Sheen and some other people? Well, it got its very own game on the Famicom from iRev. This one feels a bit different than the movie. It's a very average game of baseball with nothing really special about it. Is this Charlie Sheen? Or maybe this guy is Charlie Sheen? I mean, they both kind of look like him. I am amused by Lennar is an author on the title screen. What is that all about? Good to know, I guess. This game has really obnoxious music. I'm glad it was never released outside of Japan, and you should be too. Still, I wonder how many people have sent Famicom cartridges of this to Charlie Sheen. It'd be cool to have his autograph on it. Or how about the movie Labyrinth with Jennifer Connelly and David Bowie? It too had a game only in Japan for the Famicom. I'm playing a partially translated version here. Yeah. You play as Jennifer Connelly herself in an overhead perspective. You wander through various looping mazes. 
you can shoot down annoying enemies that surround you. Interestingly, you can shoot diagonally, but you can't move diagonally, and that all does feel a little bit weird. The hedge maze is infuriating because it can change just by going off screen and then back on again. I think this one had the potential to be an interesting game if it were tweaked a little, but we'll never know. There are still some interesting Western IPs that Japan decided to make some games about, like old shows from the 1960s, for example. More than a few, in fact. And also, games based on our junk food. Anyway, let's finish this up. Let's not forget Pepsi Man on the PlayStation from Kid. I never thought I'd have a reason to show this in an episode again. You play as Pepsi mascot Pepsi Man and you're constantly running. Your objective is to deliver Pepsi to the people who so desperately need it. You need to avoid obstacles by jumping over or sliding underneath them. You need to collect as many Pepsi cans as you can before the people at the vending machine riot. In the second stage, there's a fire and the people who are trapped inside the building need Pepsi. I absolutely love how absurd this is, but as a game, I've had my fill as soon as I played the second stage for a while and I start to get bored. Apparently so did any publishers who considered it for a Western release. You're doing pretty good. <sighs> Have a Pepsi. Anyone remember Combat? The TV show, not the Atari 2600 game. It was broadcast on ABC for nearly six years in the mid-1960s. So what better IP to make a Japan-exclusive strategy game out of? That's right, it's Sergeant Saunders Combat for the Super Famicom from Play Avenue and ASCII. This is a very slow and honestly not very interesting strategy game where you need to take down Hitler and Mussolini. Hey look, it's Vic Morrow. Sadly, this poor guy is destined to get cut up pretty badly while making Twilight Zone the movie. At least he lives on here in this game, kinda. This isn't a game for me, but it's interesting to see that they licensed an American show from the 1960s and only released it on the Super Famicom in Japan in the 1990s. Do you remember being British back in 1965 and watching Thunderbirds on TV? Hello you, of course you do. This inspired the movie Team America World Police. And it inspired Cobra to make this Japan only game called, well, Thunderbirds. The game lets you select from six different accidents. Each one features fairly unique gameplay so it's always changing things up. In one scenario, you may be flying through a burning city or dropping explosives to defeat quicksand that cars can't seem to steer around, or perhaps submarining in deep water. Each scenario will usually have at least two different areas to get through. It's honestly not bad, though some things like the controls could perhaps use a touch of refinement. The pace of the game is a bit slow as well, but that's fine. The only thing that really bothers me is that you keep getting interrupted by the 16-bit version of a radio buddy. And boy do they have a lot to say. They all know exactly what you're doing and when you do it. They certainly wouldn't be a good radio buddy if they weren't omniscient. It kind of does make the game drag a bit, but I'm sure it wouldn't be as annoying if it were in the Queen's English. Or I guess the King's English now. Oh, also if it were skippable, that would be nice. The graphics and sound are decent to good all around. I feel that this one deserved to be released outside of Japan.
This is Donald No Magical World for the Game Gear by Sims. But if you put it into a Western Game Gear, it's fully in English and appears as Ronald in the Magical World. That's right, it's a McDonald's game. This borrows a few assets from Treasureland Adventures on the Genesis, but this is its own game. It's a platformer that's more difficult than you think and the controls and physics do take some getting used to. You can whack enemies to death with a candy cane and you can use your umbrella to float down from a jump by pressing up and attack at the same time. You can also use this move to go up geysers and whatnot. There are places in each level where you can play minigames, but I recommend avoiding them. They take a long time and once you're in them, you can't get out until the minigame decides that you're done. I mean, you may like them as well as the things that you can earn from them, but I feel that they interrupt the flow. However, they're optional, so that's good. Besides that though, I feel that this game is generally pretty darn good. You need to find a key in each level to get through a door that's usually not too far from the exit. In the fourth level of a stage, you need to climb up and up and up. Then you fight the level boss. Many of these stages will take some trial and error, but you have unlimited continues as well as a password feature, though you can't continue right at the stage boss. Stages like this where you're constantly being blown to the left definitely take some of that trial and error. You really need to find a certain groove to get past these, but once you get into that groove, it can be pretty fun. The graphics and music are both very well done for the platform. It's quite sad that this one wasn't released outside of Japan, but it's no surprise since we really don't know a lot about McDonald's here in the US anyway. We have like two or three over here, but not many. Oh, what's that? I'm completely wrong? Well, so is Sega for not releasing this game in the West. Seriously, they clearly plan to release this one in the West or they wouldn't have included the English text when playing it in a Western system. But for whatever reason, they decided not to. You owe it to yourself to check this one out if you can. Finally, we have Chiki Chiki Machine Mau Race for the 3DO, also known as Wacky Races. Remember the Hanna-Barbera cartoon? You'd think this one would be a fun racing game, but of course it isn't. Instead, you bet on who you think will win the race. A hyperactive FMV with short clips of a race play and then you see the result. There is no wonder that this game was never released in the West. I'm surprised it was released at all, but I guess they love these betting things in Japan. <laughs> Somehow, they felt the need to make a sequel, Wacky Races 2. I can't tell if this is the same type of game because I just couldn't sit through the super lengthy amounts of Japanese voice. Seriously, nearly 20 minutes in and nothing has happened besides talk. I'd rather smash my face into my desk, so I turned the game off and did that instead. These games are such a disappointment, but hey, it's the 3DO. Are you even surprised? There you go, more games based on Western IPs that remained exclusive to Japan. Now for the next Left in Japan episode, I'll go back to covering so-called normal games, but I think it was fun to basically talk about a subgenre within a genre for a couple of episodes. I'm sure there are more games that qualify that I missed, so let me know which ones those were, and also let me know other games that were left in Japan that perhaps I should take a look at in the future. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSag. Nintendo Switch is an awesome video game system. I can play it right here. I can play it over here. I can play it while taking the kids to the pool. I can play it out here. Yeah, the Nintendo Switch is awesome, but why would you want to play the Nintendo Switch when you can play the Atari Lynx instead? Seriously, why would you rather play anything but the Atari Lynx? I can play it here. I can play it over here. I can play it while experiencing gastrointestinal distress. I can play it out here. 
well, not really. I can even play. Wait, I guess the batteries died. Where the hell the batteries even go in this stupid thing anyway? You know what? The Atari Link sucks because the batteries die so quickly. I think I'm gonna play some Game Gear. 